In this problem, the answer is based on cubes or squares. So if you see something like p cubed, that means that p is a function of the other variable. And if you see r squared, that means that r is not a function of the other variable. That's why in this one, s cubed means that s is a function, and t cubed means that t is also a function. And that's why in this one, x squared and y squared mean that both x and y are not functions of the opposite variable. In this problem, we will take this value and subtract this value. Once we do that, we get 30.78. That shows up in none of the answers except for option A. So A is our answer. Likewise, in this one, we take this value minus this value. We get 13.34, and that shows up in none of the answers except for option B. So B is our answer. In this problem, we look at the two numbers that are in the denominator, the one constant not attached to E and the coefficient attached to E. So we are going to perform the operation between them. So three minus 1.62, and then we will always divide by the number that's not attached to the E, so that's three. We get a decimal of 0.46, so 46% is our answer. Another one here, we look at this number and this number. We perform the operation between them, so we add them, and then we divide by the number that's not attached to E. We get 1.91, and that's equivalent to 191%. One of my favorite shortcuts, we look just at the answer choices and we go from left to right. So if we're identifying which M value is our answer, most likely because we see three 16s, it's not gonna be four. We look at the A values. We have two 2.4s and only one 4.8. So we eliminate the one with the 4.8, but we make sure to take note of the B value of the answer we've just crossed out because that will be the B value of our correct answer. For this problem, we take this number and add it to this number. We get 389, and that's our answer. Let's do one more. We'll just add these two numbers. We get 517, and that's our answer. In this problem, we'll take the number we see in the exponent and divide it by the Q value that we're given. We want to make sure to keep this negative outside the 26, and as a result, we'll get negative 0.8333, and that's our answer. Let's do one more real quick. We'll take the 20 and divide it by the 14. Make sure to keep the negative on the 20. We get about negative 1.43. We see that here, and that's our answer. In this problem, this is the one where they always have intervals with zero, middle numbers, and high numbers. So when they're asking for inelastic demand, we want to choose the interval that goes from zero to the middle number, not the high number. So in this case, D is our answer. And in this case, when they ask for elastic demand, we want to pick the interval that does not have zero, but instead starts from the middle number and goes to the high number. And so C is our answer here. In this problem, it might help to rewrite all your functions so that they're in the form of x to the a. For example, 1 over x squared goes to x to the negative 2. The value they're asking for will be the a value in one of the functions. And so in this case, because we see x to the negative 2, a is our answer. Let's do a couple more. If we write all of these in the form x to the a, we get these. And so we're looking for the a value of negative 3 fifths, and that shows up here. So c is our answer. And let's do just one more. Once we have them all in x to the a, we see negative 1 third right here. So b is our answer. In this problem, all we need to do is look at the x-intercept. That's about 0.8, and 0.8 only shows up in option b. Let's do one more. The x-intercept for which the function actually passes through the x-axis is about 3.2, and that shows up in option C. So C is our answer. In this problem, we can simply look for the curve that does something like this. We see that here, and we see that here. So B is our answer. In this problem, we take half of this value here. So 200 divided by 2 is 100. And one more time, we take half of 120 to get 60, so A is our answer here. In this big problem, we look only at the elasticity value given. We want to identify whether it's elastic or inelastic. The absolute value of it is 1.53. That is greater than 1, so it is elastic. And when it is elastic, the answer will be the marginal revenue is positive. So D is our answer. The answer will never have marginal profit. The answer will only ever have marginal revenue. So let's do one more. We look only at the elasticity. The absolute value gives us 0.524. That is less than one. Therefore, it's inelastic, which means the marginal revenue should be negative.
In this problem, you'll notice that every table has a different result for plugging in the value of 6 for x and 5 for y. So what we can do is just plug in 6 for x and 5 for y into the function and see which value is correct. As a result, we get 4370, and that only shows up in option C, so C must be our answer. So again, for this one, the lower right value is usually a good choice. You just want to make sure that all of them are different. So what we'll do is plug in 400 for L and 550 for M. As a result, we get 36,577 or about 578, and that shows up in option A, but none of the others. So A must be our answer. And for this problem, if you're curious about a method to avoid using Excel and sort of just like memorize what the 3D images of functions like this would look like, feel free to check out this shortcut video. So in this problem, all we need to do is just take the derivative of the inside layer with respect to z. z to the 6th goes to 6z to the 5th. We want to make sure to leave the x to the 7th and the y cubed. This z on the end goes to 1, and we leave the 4x multiplied, so really it's just plus 4x. So all we want to do is look for this expression in the numerator of our answer. We see a 6, we see a 4, and that's really all we need to tell that d is our answer. Let's do one more like that. So in this case, we're taking the derivative of just the inside layer, but with respect to y this time. y squared goes to 2y. We want to make sure to leave the x to the 7th and the z attached. 5z will go to 0 because there's no y terms. So we just want to find this term in our answer somewhere. We see the 2 here and the 2 here, but nowhere else. So a must be our answer. In this problem, what you would typically have to do is the product rule between this expression and this expression. But what you can do is just find the derivative of one of those expressions and just make sure it's with respect to y. So taking the derivative of just the first part with respect to y, y to the 10th would go to 10y to the 9th. We would make sure to leave the 2x to the 5th attached, and then we'll just multiply these two terms. So 2 times 10 gives us 20, and we'd leave the x to the 5th and y to the 9th. Do we see this expression in any of the answers? We see a 20 in a lot of the answers, but do we see a 20x to the 5th, y to the 9th in all these answers? We do not. We only see it in this answer A, so A must be our answer. In this problem, we're given a bunch of terms to take the derivative of with respect to x twice. So just pick an x term to take the derivative of twice. 4x to the 4th. 4x to the 4th has a derivative of 16x cubed. 16x cubed has a derivative of 48x squared. We want to find 48x squared in one of these answers. We only see it in option A, so A is our answer. And in this problem, we're given a bunch of terms to find the derivative of with respect to y, then with respect to x. So we want to pick a term that has both x and y in it. This is probably the easier one to deal with. When taking the derivative of this with respect to y, the y term is in the denominator, so it helps to rewrite it out of the denominator with the help of negative exponents. Now, take the derivative of this with respect to y. y to the negative fifth becomes negative 5y to the negative sixth. We leave the x cubed attached. Now we take the derivative of this with respect to x. x cubed becomes 3 3x squared. We leave the negative 5y to the negative 6. We multiply the 3 and the negative 5 to get negative 15. Leave the x squared and go ahead and throw the y to the 6 back to the denominator. Really, the negative 15 is the most important part because that shows up in option A and nowhere else. And so A is our answer. In this one, to avoid chain rule and product rule, we're taking the derivative of just the inside layer with respect to x twice. The derivative of this with respect to x would be 20x cubed. We take the derivative one more time and we get 60x squared. We see a 60x squared in only option B, so B is our answer. In this case, to avoid chain rule and quotient rule, we'll take the derivative of just this x term and just this y term and multiply them together. Again, that's because they're asking for the derivatives with respect to both x and y. So somewhere along the way, we would have to take the derivative of the x term to get 14x and the y term to get 14y. We multiply them together to get 196xy. Now, if you don't see a 196 in any of the answers, which we do not, keep in mind we do want to see an x and a y next to each other. We don't see it here, 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 but we do see it here. So odds are that 196 got divided by something to give us a 49xy, but regardless, we still want to find that xy in our answer. So if the coefficients don't always work out, keep in mind, just look at the other variables that you have. 
in this problem where they're asking for the second partials test, but they give you this annoying E function. First thing to check is whether we have a critical point at this ordered pair or not. The quick way to do that is to go ahead and find the derivative with respect to x of just the exponent. The derivative with respect to x is 6x plus 2. The derivative with respect to y is just negative 10y. And what we want to do is plug in this ordered pair into x and y accordingly. And we're looking for both of these to equal 0 because that would mean this ordered pair is a critical point. We get 0 for the first one, but 10 for the second one. So this 10 not being equal to zero shows us that f does not have a critical point at this ordered pair. So just remember to check whether it has a critical point or not, but here's the real shortcut for this problem once you check that it has a critical point or not. Looking at the original function, pay close attention just to the x squared and the y squared terms. What we're going to pay attention to is the sign of each of them. If the x squared is positive and the y squared is negative, in other words they have opposite signs, that will lead f to having a saddle point at at that ordered pair. Again, that also goes for if x squared is negative and y squared is positive. As long as they have opposite signs in the original function, then f will have a saddle point. Now, if the answer were a maximum, what we would look for in the original function is a negative x squared term and a negative y squared term. And if the answer were a minimum, the original function would have a positive x squared term and a positive y squared term. And that's all there is to it. And in this problem, all we need is this equation usually, but sometimes we also need this equation. So, so starting with the first equation, we're looking at this function to get the exponent of L and the exponent of K. Exponent of L is 9 tenths, and since K is underneath a square root, the exponent of K is 1 half. This result is multiplied by K, and then we add K, and then we set it equal to the budget given in the problem, which is 17,000. 9 tenths divided by 1 half is 1.8. That's times K plus K. That's equal to 17,000. We add these k terms. 1.8 plus 1 is 2.8k. We divide by 2.8 and we find that k is 6,071.4. They always round this value to the nearest thousand. So k is about 6,000 and this is our capital expenditure. So we see 6,000 in two of the answers. So this is a case where we'd actually have to use the second equation to solve for L. And once we have L, that will be the worker hours. So we start with the wage given in the problem. That's 850 times L plus the k value we just solved for. So 6,071.4, we set it equal to the budget. And again, our goal is to solve for L. We get this, we divide by 8.5, we get about 1285, and they will always round this to the nearest 100. So 1300 is the amount of worker hours. So C is our answer here. A reminder, if you see this problem and you see functions like this with 10th roots or 5th roots, 10th root is equivalent to an exponent of 1 tenth, and a 5th root is equivalent to an exponent of 1 fifth. Shortcuts are fun, but don't rely on these solely when studying for the final. Study the quick quiz lessons, your old quizzes and exams, and practice as many problems as you can. Just do your best. Love, Carter.